Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! We will move on now, OK, to the question, I think, of homeopathy, although I'm just hearing some rather troubling news involving the so-called black cab rapist John Warboys. Um, I learned that the government won't be seeking a judicial review over the parole board's decision to release him, which is the sum total of the breaking news information. We haven't really talked about John Warboys together since... This astonishing decision was taken for two reasons. Number one is I find myself in the very rare position of, well, look, whenever you talk about a legal decision as a journalist, you're doing it from a position of considerably less knowledge than the people who've taken the legal decision. And usually that, that, that makes me feel it's rather irresponsible and, and a little bit, um, well, thick, actually, would be the word I'd use to, to pretend that you know better. But, of course, it's, it's great bums on seat stuff, tickets for the ghost train territory, uh, to claim that judges are idiots or that the, the, the people in charge have done something wrong. But on this one, I couldn't muster up the enthusiasm to explain that again. I usually can, but this fella, I, I'd have thrown away the key. Well, I, I understand, I think, some of the elements that other people in this business pretend not to understand. The number of crimes he was accused of and believed to have committed dwarfed the number of crimes of which he was convicted a decision by the CPS not to pursue more prosecutions, more cases, um, certainly is worthy of further scrutiny. But once that decision was taken, the judges and the judge and the sentencing guidelines conspired to create an environment in which the sentence he got was pretty much the most he could have got. And, and under the terms of that tariff, he becomes eligible for parole after X number of years and the parole board decide whether or not he still poses a threat to the public. They have concluded that he hasn't. Um, how, how irresponsible of me now would it be to speculate on why he doesn't pose a threat to the public anymore in the view of the parole board? Because I've got one theory, but it's absolutely out there. Um, I don't think that David Goak, the new -ish Justice Secretary, had any, any choice at all on this. I think that, again, journalists reached its apotheosis, didn't it, during the, um, the, the, the case of that little lad in Great Ormond Street Hospital when people in my business started trying to claim they knew more than people in the medical world. Or the Pope stuck his oar in, um, claiming to have a better insight into is it Charlie Gard's plight than the um, doctors at Great Ormond Street have. This is the Trumpification, isn't it, of, of, of the English-speaking world. Uh, judges, academics, uh, doctors, financiers... I, I gotta just ignore them. Why, why are we why are we listening to them? And Connor Gillies did a brilliant report from America. It was played out on uh, on Nick's show earlier, um, and and he and he found a Trump supporter who said something pretty much to that effect. Trump's proving that you don't have to you know put everything in the hands of, and that's what we've done now. I, I don't know why the parole board decided John Warboys was no longer a threat to the British public, but I'm not on the parole board, so I have next to none of the information they would have had to reach that as a human being whose heart occasionally trumps his head. It's the kind of crime that makes you contemplate the uh, support for capital punishment, despite all its flaws. It's the kind of um, uh, case that makes you line up with people who you'd normally cross the road to avoid because they're shouting ignorantly about life meaning life and what have you. But, but this was vile. The, the man was a monster. The parole board have decided he isn't anymore, and I find that just as hard to process as you do. But if we don't trust our justice system and fully understand how it works, then the rule of law itself is under threat. And you know how the people in charge of this country feel about the rule of law. Judges are enemies of the people if they hand down judgments that certain individuals on Fleet Street don't like. What a tangled web we weave. So that's why I don't think we will talk about John Warboys, because I can't imagine anybody ringing me to disagree with the essentially emotional observation that the man should be chemically castrated and and then have the keys thrown away. See? Even I can do a little bit of tub-thumping reactionary tabloid journalism occasionally, but only when I really mean it. Twelve minutes after eleven is the time. Uh, no tub-thumping reactionary tabloid journalism next, because 
I just don't know what to think about the question of whether the NHS should carry on funding homeopathic treatments. Lots of people swear by them. Lots of vets... Um, actually, I probably shouldn't speak without double-checking my facts, but last time we discussed it, you told me that lots of vets employ homeopathic uh, treatments. £92,000 was spent last year by the NHS... Well, no, actually, it goes up. 92,000 was spent on homeopathic medicines um, and £5 million a year is spent by the NHS on sending patients to homeopathic hospitals. So I think, in the spirit of uh, Carillion and PFI and the city conversation we had in the first hour, I, I'd like someone from within the NHS to tell me why. I, I'm pretty much of the view that homeopathy is a load of old rubbish because the, the numbers don't work. You put a tiny, tiny particle of something into a, a solution where the ratio is about a gazillion, a carillion to one. So you have one part active ingredient and uh, a carillion parts water. And the idea is that that somehow in, in, infiltrates your system. It's almost like magic and cures you of your ills. I think that's a load of old hogwash. Um, I know that when you're desperate, you go down all sorts of routes in search of um, cure. When I was struggling with um, my fertility problems, I ended up having a, a strange bloke waving divinity sticks at me um, while I stood there in my Homer Simpson underpants and he waved twigs all around in front of me because you just go anywhere when you're, when you're desperate. Um, it didn't work. He's the same fellow that told me I should start drinking mare's milk. I spent half a day on the internet trying to track down mare's milk, uh, as in the milk of a female horse. The only one I could find was powdered milk from a, from a, a French foal sanctuary. I thought, God, that's not going to cure me. It's not, it's not going to make my sperm healthier, is it? Powdered French horse's milk. I may never know. Uh, but that's what I mean. So it, I would have done homeopathy, I did acupuncture, I would have done anything. Um, whether or not the NHS should be paying for it is a very political question. But it's also quite a personal one, because... If it is rubbish, if it's not peer-reviewed, if it is the load of old hokum that, that many of us consider it to be, why on earth is the NHS spending £5 million a year sending patients to homeopathic hospitals? That, I think, is your starter for 10. Why? Given how easy it is to find evidence and, and opinion that, that homeopathy can't possibly work, uh, the plural of anecdote, I'd remind you, is never data, then why are we spending... Why are doctors, who are fully medically trained sending patients to homeopathic hospitals. I am floating the possibility that that suggests lots of fully qualified medics don't think it is complete hokum. 0345 6060 is the number that you need. It's quarter past 11, and, and seeing as we're all feeling rather chipper and the weekend is around the corner, I will allow you, just one or two of you, to ring in and say homeopathy must work because I take homeopathic remedies and I'm not currently poorly. It's the hottest alternative health fad. It boasts an impressively vast and well-stocked medical cabinet. It's endorsed by royalty and the stars and is doing a booming trade in high street pharmacies. 500 million people worldwide claim to use it. What is it? It's a system for dosing up on a dilute solution of water. Welcome to the bizarre world of homeopathy. Homeopathy was dreamed up in the late 18th century as a way of boosting the body's vital spirit. One of the central tenets handed down by its founder, Samuel Hahnemann, was that like cures like. Superficially, this might sound faintly plausible, but unlike a vaccine that introduces a diminished form of a virus into the body in order to provoke its immune system, like cures like makes the unfounded assumption that what causes similar symptoms can cure those symptoms. In Hahnemann's world, dilute poison ivy cures skin rash because undiluted, it causes a rash if touched. By the same principle, red onion can alleviate streaming eyes and snake venom stiffness. But amazingly, homeopathy gets even stranger still. Homeopaths claim that the more you dilute an active ingredient in water, the stronger medicine it becomes. Most homeopathic remedies are marked 30C. What does that mean? 
It means one part medicine to a hundred to the power of 30 parts water. How much? A drop in a fish tank? No? A fish tank is nowhere near big enough. The swimming pool doesn't provide enough dilution. Not even a lake. What about a drop in the ocean? But it turns out that even the sea isn't big enough. For the really approved homeopathic recipes, in order to get one molecule of the active substance, you need to imbibe all the atoms in the solar system. To science, just doesn't make sense. Even homeopaths acknowledge that there is not a single molecule of active ingredient in the bottle they sell you. It's just water. So how can it possibly work? In an attempt to resolve the paradox, homeopathy boldly paddles further up the creek of pseudoscience, claiming that water somehow has a memory of the now completely absent active ingredient. But wouldn't water also have memory of other, more common impurities it's come into contact with? Salt, urine. Scientists have calculated that in each glass of water we drink, at least one molecule has passed through the bladder of Oliver Cromwell. Incredibly, you and I are paying for this unproven industry through our taxes. Despite the National Health Service's net £540 million deficit for 2006, the refurbishment of the Royal Homeopathic Hospital was part funded by the NHS to the tune of £10 million. That's equivalent to 500 nurses' salaries. Right here on the floor, here's a point to illustrate. Wooden floors, very unusual in a modern healthcare facility. This hospital was only completed 18 months ago. So this is our main clinical area. The homeopathic profession is unregulated by government. You can call yourself a homeopath without any qualification, training or even insurance. After all, all you're doing is dishing out water solution. This is all rather contradictory, so let's be clear about the latest evidence. In 2005, the medical journal The Lancet surveyed all the meta-analyses, the analyses of the analyses, and failed to find any reliable effect of homeopathy. Tellingly, for me, in the bigger trials, less prone to chance anomalies, homeopathy was more likely to show zero demonstrable effect. And yet, despite the lack of robust evidence, homeopathy thrives. Many clinicians look on in horror at the unlevel playing field of trials and evidence for medical licensing. In 2004, American trials seemed to show that the drug Herceptin could halve the death rate for a particularly virulent form of breast cancer. This was a major breakthrough. Patients understandably clamored for the new drug, but unlike in the world of homeopathy, the claims of scientific medicine are tested rigorously, and that takes time. Accordingly, the license was delayed. We went through a period of a year or two when Herceptin, quite rightly in my opinion, uh, was held up for the treatment of breast cancer until all the evidence was there. So we had extremely rigid cost-effectiveness analysis before we could use Herceptin. And, okay, there was a short passage of time when it seemed unfair. But you compare that when actually lives are lost because we're talking about life-threatening disease with drugs which actually save lives to the way that ineffective, irrational remedies are just being nodded through. I mean, it makes you weep. The pharmaceutical industry takes a lot of knocks. And yes, drugs are very expensive. But the reason they're so expensive is there may be 20 years of R&D to get to an effective product. Every step of the way is checked and double-checked. 
And now, through the back door, we're getting a class of compound being allowed into the marketplace with a licence, with no such evidence of efficacy. I can't understand how you could even... But if homeopathy isn't tested properly or flunks its trials, then why do homeopaths remain popular? A lot of them owe their success, not to the homeopathy, but to the fact they are decent people. They have time, they're compassionate, they look the patient in the eye, they talk to someone for an hour. These are nice people. I would like to recruit these really nice people to practice proper medicine. And then in the end, what we've got are proper doctors, empathetic doctors, who will, in addition to the placebo effect of being that kind of physician, they can also add in truly effective drugs. Clinical trials show that homeopathy simply cannot match up with safe chemical drugs. Yet in the realm of petty ailments like sore eyes or itchy scalp, homeopathy is probably innocent enough. Because it's really all about attentive doctors spending time listening to the patient. That one is still, the right one is still a tiny bit puffy, isn't it? Or is it? Well, it's always like that. Then giving them something that makes them feel better, precisely because it's supposed to make them feel better. I think it's all down to the placebo effect. It's a lot of old rubbish. It's been demonstrated fairly uh, definitively that it doesn't work. Um, but. The NHS spends five million quid on homeopathy. First question is why. Second question is, it probably depends on your answer to the first question, is, is should the NHS be banned from doing so? 0345 6060 Katie is in Whitney, David Cameron country. Katie, what can you tell us? No? Not homeopathy from my point Sorry, of view. So start again. I, I pressed the wrong button. Oh, actually, I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to take this one for the team. Jacob pressed the wrong button then, and I didn't hear what you said, Katie, so would you mind starting again? Sorry. Um, Why are you saying I, sorry? That's so female. Know. It was Jacob's mistake, <laughs> and a woman said sorry. I think my main objection to homeopathy is that uh, it's not held up to the same kind of standards as other medicines. OK, so I work in vaccine development. If you want to make a new vaccine and sell it to anybody, you do clinical trials, you yeah. register it with the MHRA, all those kinds of processes. And there is very, very little really good, high-quality evidence that homeopathic medicines work. There isn't any. Well, there are a few clinical trials, a few good ones. Really? But they're really, really few and far between, given the prominence that homeopathy has in places like the NHS and in the local high street. And that's what worries me. Well, and that is why I don't think it would necessarily be fair to ban it outright, to say people aren't allowed to sell homeopathic remedies. It would probably need to be slightly differently regulated, but I presume yeah. you find the idea... of no. I don't know, though, because if you don't, can't do clinical trials to show they're safe, then should people be buying them, assuming that well, they here's are? Here's my problem, OK? And, and I've mentioned this woman a few times over the years, but not, not for about six or seven years. When I was growing up in Kidderminster, um, and, and I was at a convent school, there was a very devout Irish lady who had several children in the school, and her youngest had been born with a club foot. And she used to bathe her baby's club foot in holy water every morning and every evening. Would you ban that? No, I'm not going to ban water. Um, but isn't that what isn't that what banning homeopathy would involve? Yeah, I know it's a difficult one. I just I just worry that people get harmed by things that they think. Are well, safe. that's what I mean by and regulation. So, something a medicine. Yeah, I'm going to call it a medicine. I think it should be supported by evidence that it works in the same way that every other medicine is. And there seems to be this kind of exception for homeopathic medicine. Yeah, there does, I get that. And it's not some ancient thing either, is it? It was dreamt up by a German fella in the 19th century, if memory serves. Yeah, that's right. Have you read his book? Yeah, of course it's I really have. It's really fascinating. Is it? Uh, yeah, it's worth a read. Uh, books. They books. They just sort of give people knowledge and understanding of issues. Down, down, <laughs> know, down, with, down terrible, with books. It's Brexit thing. Britain. Books will be banned. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that's my concern, that it's not really very well regulated and it's not held up to the same standards as other medicines. Um, OK, so why do, you think, why, why do you think five million quid a year is spent on sending patients to homeopathic hospitals? I, I completely think it should not be. The NHS should ban untested medicines, whether they're homeopathic or, you know, whatever type of medicines they are. If they haven't been tested, the NHS should not be encouraging their use. 
Okay. And uh, what, what are your qualifications? Do you mind me asking? Uh, no, I've got a PhD in immunology. I work in vaccine development. PhD in, in immunology and yeah. you work in vaccine development and it's a big yeah. no from from the Whitney jury on the question of, of homeopathy and yes support for the ban but I, I need to know a little bit more about the whys before we do the what's. Five million quid means that five million pounds worth of NHS expertise um, it, it backs homeopathy I think, I could be reading it wrong. Mike's in Marlow Mike what would you like to say? Jacob is Mike, is Mike there? 24 minutes after 11. It doesn't matter. As long as there is a tiny, tiny, tiny part of Mike on the line, um, diluted to the power of about 10 million, then I can continue the conversation with him under the, under the uh, rules and regulations, the principles of homeopathy. Um, if you know why £5 million worth of public money is spent every year on sending patients to homeopathic hospitals, I'd love to hear from you. And my sort of example of the holy water and the baby born with a club foot is, is not silly. I, I do mean it. The uh, simple state of affairs is that people believe in something and occasionally the thing that they believe in actually happens. You will never persuade them. It's like the, the crutches and the um, wheelchairs abandoned at, at the pilgrimage site of Lourdes in France. You'll never persuade them that there isn't a link between the two things. And it's, it's, it's unkind to try to. So that's why we're focusing on the public money question. Uh, Mike is in Marlow. Mike, what would you like to say? Yeah, good morning, James. I've been dying to get on this one with you. Um, my wife's a homeopath. I've, I've got friends that are homeopaths. I've been using it pretty much all my life. I don't even know my doctor's name. That's how effective it is. Yeah, um, you should probably find out in case you ever get poorly. <laughs> but that's the point. There's six and a half million people, James, who mm. use alternative medicine every year, and you're up and on about five million quid's worth of drugs. It doesn't even compare. Well, no, there's that's no drugs involved. The population. There's no drugs involved, is there? Well, this all right. Uh, remedies. Let's, let's get. No. This is treatment. I think if there's a homeopathic hospital, that five million quid is going to be spent on everything from the heating bills to. Yeah. to, yeah, to well, I'm not sure. I don't know actually. I don't know enough about it. No. But but I mean. What would you do if you got... Forgive me, Mike, but I, I'm going to ask you a couple of robust questions, if that's OK. Yeah. yeah, 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 of course. What would you do if you got cancer? I would seek the appropriate treatment. Right, so make sure you find out your doctor's name and get registered sharpish, all right? Well, not necessarily, yeah. not necessarily. So you mean the appropriate treatment might, take... might not be medicine? It might not be, no. No, it could be all sorts of things. Okay. But, but that's the point, you see. If you've got this closed mind on everything, then... Uh, then nothing's gonna nothing's gonna sway you. But the point is, that well, no, of course something's gonna sway me, Mike. Uh, Peer-reviewed peer evidence will sway me. Well, listen. Well, ask six and a half million people why they use alternative medicine. Yeah, but that's not peer-reviewed medicine. That's um, anecdote. No, it's not anecdote, James. It's fact. No, no, no. It's it's, fact the, 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 six and a half million people use alternative medicine. Now you prove that it's cured anything. That, that's where the facts come in. it has. I mean, listen, I had an ingrown toenail. I mean, it sorted that out. I mean, I mean, there's, there's all uh, fun things that will sort out an ingrown what do you, what do you take for it, What do you take for an ingrown toenail? Either, either magnetic north or magnetic south, depending on which toe it is. Which foot it is. You see, now, now that's really going to throw you, isn't it? Well, no, it's the opposite. <laughs> I'll tell you what you have done. What? You've persuaded me completely that it has to be banned. What have we got? RTA, broken arm, suspected internal injuries, severe contusions to the head. I'm going to need to move fast. Probably a solution of Arnica Montana, stat. Strength? One part in a million. I'm sure, it looks serious. You're right, we need to strengthen the dose. One part in ten million. On it, Doctor. Well, you're going to treat you one. Nothing we can't handle. Get me some wolfsbane, also known as monkshood in here. And a whole tray of flower remedies. Whoa, the chakras are fading. I'm going to need some crystals. Nurse, patient with some purple tinted quartz. You're right. Make that aquamarine quartz. Good call. Okay, he's stabilizing. Now, does anybody know what sort of car hit him? A blue Ford Mondeo, apparently. Right, get me a bit of blue Ford Mondeo, put it in water, shake it, dilute it, shake it again, dilute it again, do some more shaking, dilute it some more, and then put three drops on his tongue. If that doesn't cure him, I don't know what will. Maybe you should have a look at this, Simon. What is it? I don't think this poor chap's got long to live. Why not? His lifeline. Very short. <laughs> but his horoscope's not too clever either. Sagittarius. Brace yourself for a surprise. Things are about to change for you. Certainly are, unless... Wait. What? We could try drawing a bit more lifeline on with Byro. It would never work. You got a better idea? Let's see what happens.
Time of death, 3.34. Ish. Tough day, eh? I just can't stand losing them. It happens. I don't know. Sometimes I think a trace solution of deadly nightshade or a statistically negligible quantity of arsenic just isn't enough. That's crazy talk, Simon. Okay, so you kill the odd patient with cancer or heart disease or bronchitis, flu, chicken pox or measles. But when someone comes in with a vague sense of unease or a touch of the nerves or even just more money than sense, you'll be there for them. A bottle of basically just water in one hand and a huge invoice in the other. I suppose you're right. Now, another drink. I need one. Excuse me. Two more homeopathic lockers, please. <laughs> Whoa, that's strong stuff. No, nonsense. But you're, mate, you're going to get into all sorts of bother with these beliefs. I'm not in any sorts of bother. No, I'm not, nearly not, 60 years not, old. Not I'm yet. absolute road health. Yeah, and, but and well, if, if you I get, get really, really wrong, poorly and you try and cure it with, I don't know, voodoo... No, I'm going no, to really miss you, Mike. No, 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 no. You I'm going to really miss you, Mike. Terminology. You yeah. <laughs> Listen, I ain't going anywhere, Mike. All right. And what are your... Uh, ma what are your terminology, James. How long did your wife study to, be to become a homeopath? Sorry? How, how long did your wife study to become a homeopath? Oh, years and years and years. Oh, well, how many years and years and years? Oh, I, I can't remember. I don't know. Four or five years, something well, like full -time that. Full-time study? Then, um, yeah. For, where did yeah. she go? And then, the, and then no, 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 James, listen, don't... Do not poo-poo it, because... I think you need to read up on it. If, and you if, need to can I can I poo poo it if I use a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of poo diluted to a million parts well, of you water? Go. You see, this is this is part of your rhetoric. This tiny, tiny. Man, it's homeopathy, the Mike. Everything. There's no peer-reviewed evidence for it at all. There I, I, is, James. There is, James. You need to read into this okay. before you start slagging it off again. Honestly, uh, mate. All right, mate. What should I read first? I don't know. I'm not the homeopath, but there are plenty. There's plenty of studies. Well, what done. did you there's read plenty then? Of reasons why. What did you read that persuaded you it's the real deal? I don't need to read anything, mate. I've got a. I, my my right. wife and friends of mine are, are homeopaths, and they're all. Right, so if I so if I if I read something, then I'd be as persuaded as you are that it works. But you haven't read no, anything, I, and you can't recommend anything to me to read. No, I've got 20 years of, of using homeo homeopathy and not going to my GP. Surely that's evidence enough, isn't it? Oh, mate. Did you vote Brexit? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great weekend, Mike, really. Because that's, <laughs> 20, that's evidence. No, it's not blinking evidence. That just means you haven't been poorly for 20 years. Ah, oh, dear. Um, keep it friendly. Why are we spending money on something that isn't science? 0345 6060 But... Actually, maybe Mike should push me in the other direction. Mike's getting something out of it. I, I believe um, in mind over matter on some issues, not, not all issues, but I do think that the great uh, swathes of the human brain that go more or less unused by us in the course of our normal life probably have some sort of powers that we don't yet understand. And one of them might be the power of positive thinking. I, 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 I believe that if Mike honestly derives that sense of confidence and... Uh, what would the other word be? Belief from homeopathy, then... Yeah, I tell you, is he still there? I've, I'm going, I'm doing a U-turn. I'm doing a reverse ferret on this one. Mike is actually... I still think it's all nonsense, personally, but the passionate belief that it's not nonsense could actually have health-giving properties. I, I was thinking about Twitter um, uh, for a couple of reasons. I love Twitter for, for all of the uh, sewage that often appears on there. I think it's been such an amazing addition to um, uh, public discourse. Uh, do you know what I was doing yesterday? I, I, got, I, I saw that I got followed by the lead singer of Radiohead, Tom York, who's a hero of mine. I had a little exchange on direct message with the, with the actor Eddie Marson, um, who is, for my money, one of the best British actors on the planet. And then Mark Billingham, the crime writer, tweeted something. Um, I, I think possibly said something nice about something I'd done. So I replied to him, um, and I said, just so you know... I, I'm pretty sure that TT listens to the show. And Mark Billingham replied saying, oh, God, having a bit of a senior moment, James, who's TT? And I replied, Tom Thorne, mate, the, the, the detective who features in every single one of your best-selling novels and television series. So I, just, I, I just enjoyed it a lot. And, um, and, and it made me realise when we use it on the show, 
it, it, it adds a new dimension, I think, to the time that we spend together and people who would rather uh, pull out their own eyes than actually ring up a radio station, which we often forget is the massive majority of people listening, um, can get involved in different ways and new ways. But I, I, I wish we could move on to a new level because I'd love to know whether it's only me after listening to Mike in Marlowe who just Googled, can an ingrown toenail cure itself? Because that, of course, would be the... Skeptical response to his claim that a magnetic north homeopathic remedy had somehow cured his ingrown toenail, which is odd because I thought that homeop homeopathy depended upon the, forgive me, Mike, nonsense that a tiny, tiny little bit of the thing that makes you ill could cure you of that illness. So I don't know how that would work. Did you take a little bit of toenail? But anyway, I googled it. Guess what the answer is? Is it possible for an ingrown toenail to heal itself? Go on, guess. Paul's in chance with guest, Paul. Well, you just crashed my call, really. Oh, <laughs> sorry. So well, well what do you um, mean? Yeah, but that's, but that's the whole thing about homeopathy. I don't, I don't believe in it. Um, I don't. I, th I think it's obviously bunk and, and rubbish. But the reason it works is evolution, because everything it, we've we've evolved to get better without any outside agency. So it, everything that doesn't kill you gets better. So homeopathy goes into the body and does nothing. <laughs> and when the body gets better on its own, the person, anecdotally... Goes away, uh, like Michael in Marlowe. And yeah. don't, please, can you, everyone stop telling me that they haven't been to the doctors for 20 years either and they would never go near homeopathy yeah. in, 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 in their life. Because, look, Mike yeah. might not have realised that it didn't prove anything, but, but I do, yeah. so you don't need to remind me of that. But hang on a minute, you, you, you're being a bit rhetorical, Paul. Well, I'm being Occam's razor, I think. No, so because you, because you didn't answer the question. Cat, yeah, but I think you're about to get a bit of a public shaming, mate. Go on. Because an ingrown toenail can't cure itself. Ah, ah, however... No, it can, I'm teasing. Mate, I'm yanking your chain. For the record, hashtag fake news, an ingrown toenail can cure itself, so Mike's what? ingrown toenail doesn't necessarily provide incontrovertible yeah. evidence that homeopathy works. But the reason, and, and, and I'm an ex-psychiatric nurse, so I know, I, I know a little bit of what I speak in terms of how people feel about Indeed, stuff. yes, I absolutely. Don't I don't believe, I don't believe um, positive thinking does anything. It makes people feel good, but it doesn't, it doesn't get you better. Do you, I won't pause there. I, I, I'm picking a fight with a psychiatric nurse now. I must oh, be bonkers. Ex-psychiatric nurse. Ex nurse. Pause there, because I, 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 I think... I think it does. I think feeling better... No, 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 it just makes you feel better. It doesn't actually make you better. It doesn't fix the thing, but you feel better about the fixing. But don't you think... You feel better about what you've done. Yeah. But that, don't you think that could contribute to, 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 a, to, a, no, to a cure? No, no, of course not. Of yeah. course not. Of course not. Don't be silly. Well, you know, you know, if you've got like, two people with... If you've got two people with cancer... Yeah. Oh, maybe I am being silly. Yeah, you're being silly. Yeah, but all right, I haven't finished yet. Good. Okay, but cancer isn't cured by positive thinking. No, cancer but 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 I think it might help, don't you? If if you were lying there no, thinking might, that you were definitely going to die, then stop interrupting me when I'm interrupting you, Paul. <laughs> Don't interrupt me. Either. But it, 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 might, it, it might help their depression. It might help their mood. And it that might help their recovery. It, it might do. Ah, but it won't yeah. fix the cancer. No, I that's know, but it might help their recovery. But, but no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make a disconnect between positive thinking and any physical change in the body. That's the disconnect. But I, I want to go back to my original point because I, I believe that the NHS should spend some money on, on homeopathy, mm. not because it works, but because it saves money. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it saves money because the people who can't, you know, who are distrustful of doctors, who want to be sent, you know... Mike and Marlowe. Yeah, would get very, you know, they might, they might... Um, yeah, I'm with uh, you. I agree with you. Uh, might, it's a bit like going to church. I wouldn't ban... I come out of church feeling a lot better than I did when I went in, but I wouldn't want to have a long evidence-based conversation about what I believe and don't believe. It, it cheers me right up. I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist, so I don't... I don't. But, you know, for me, if I'm feeling down, I'll put on a Led Zeppelin record. You know, and that, that, that's my going to Which church. one? Any of them. They're really? But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mainly physical graffiti, I think. Oh, nice. Houses of the Holy, but no. So, do you, so do you want me to knock you out with some Led Zeppelin-based trivia? <laughs> Go on. You know, I don't know if you were listening yesterday. I mentioned that my mum. I, got, I did, didn't know. No, well, in Kidderminster, my mum takes hours to walk around Tesco's because she knows everyone. She's one of those very garrulous yeah. people. And and when she was um, uh, a bit younger, she had a dress agency 
in Kidderminster, mm -hmm. and they'd go to schools and uh, and you know cancer research charities, coffee mornings, and they'd do a fashion show. And Mum would flog some dresses, and the charity would sell the tickets, so everyone was a winner. And we were driving down the hill from the convent school uh, I mentioned a moment ago, and we saw. I don't really remember this because I was quite young, but Mum saw a woman of a certain age who was incredibly striking. Paul, a real you know amazing figure and very striking and wonderful posture. And my mum being my mum, she, she just pulled over for a chat and, and asked her if she'd be interested in doing some modelling for my mum's dress agency. Guess who that woman was, Paul? Uh, Robert Plant. <laughs> Similar haircut. You've spoiled my moment. Stop it. All right, you get the gag. All right, you can take that to the bank and now we're going to do it properly. Guess who that woman was, Paul? Uh, I don't know, James. Who was that woman? John Bonham's mum. Oh, John Bonham's mum. That's quite good. Uh, That's quite good? Quite good. <laughs> Quite yeah, good. Yeah, no, that's no, not bad. All right, I've got another one. I've got another one. Before we go, no, no, before we go. No, this is more important. Another one. Robert Plant's son went to my prep school. Yeah. Well, that's lovely. Was it uh, Corak? Was it what? His name was Corak Plant. No, he, he, he wasn't there at the same time as me, but I think his name was Logan. No. Logan Plant. Logan, yeah, Corak and Logan. Because one of them, uh, actually, no, one of them didn't didn't live long enough to get to prep school. Oh, that's one of his son died in a. In a car crash, oh, I believe. Yeah, well, that's obviously put something of a shadow over the conversation that we've been having. He came round to look at the school in his leather trousers, and the headmaster, who was an unreconstructed snob, crashing, crashing man, um, had to kind of pretend that he wasn't disgusted by this long-haired man covered in jewellery and tattoos and wearing leather trousers being shown around the school. But we've gone off topic a bit. Say something clever about homeopathy. About Can I just talk about the vet? Yeah. Why vets use homeopathy? Go on. They're not treating the animal. They're treating the owner. Oh, he's good. And because they know that there's nothing... The, the, the dog, for example, will get better, because dogs are, are better at getting better but than the, But the human is getting all stressed and scared. Yes. And so he's treating, he's treating the owner, because the owner's a pain in the backside. Your, well, you, that, can, you, can, you can get a treatment for that as well. Preparation yeah. H. But there you go. That, that's, that's, that's my theory of homeopathy. Paul, you're a star. I, I, if I'm honest with you, I was expecting more for my Led Zeppelin anecdotes. I'll be, I, but apart from that, you've been a really first-class caller. All right, thanks a lot, mate. Cheers, Paul. Jeremy is in Wimbledon. Jeremy, what would you like to say? I would like to say that homeopathy does work but I wish it could be called complementary medicine rather than alternative. It's not a matter of either or. There is a place for allopathic regular medicine. This would be Prince Charles's position, I think, wouldn't it? Probably, mm. probably. But I know from my own situation, it, it works for me. It work, My wife, for instance, my wife had a, a serious surgery. Yes. I said to the surgeon, do you mind if she takes some homeopathic remedies. He says, no, no, whatever, whatever. Um, she took some remedies uh, w which help prepare the body for the traumatic shock of having a bloody great knife stuck in it. And yes. <laughs> um, she was in the Portman Women's Hospital. Mm. The nurses could not believe how she recovered so promptly. We mentioned this, they mentioned it to the surgeon who said, oh, I must be a better surgeon than I thought. Anyway, a friend of ours' wife was going in to have a similar, the same operation. And I said, listen, you don't believe in it, you don't need to believe in it, but here are some little thingies, yes. take these and see what happens. They were stunned and amazed at how well she did. And he said, listen, mate, I've got to pay you. I said, look, it does, honestly, it's a gift. There's only 370 anyway. <laughs> He said, I've got 150 quid on me at the moment. I'll give you the rest later. I said, no, three pounds. <laughs> None of this proves that it works, but it does prove well, that, that it probably shouldn't be banned. It's complementary, not alternative. It's not really, no, but it's buy. not really medicine, Jeremy, despite your experiences. I don't know what it is, then. It's, well, it's a remedy. It's a placebo. It, 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 it works on the mind. The belief, you're, just the belief that it's going to work, obviously kind of creates some sort of environment that, that you'd be more relaxed. You'd just be more uh, at one with the world. It's, it's a weird one. It is like religion. Religion makes you feel better. So does homeopathy. Well, no, do you know what? I've broken lots of bones. <laughs> homeopathy does not mend bones. Right, on that we will agree. Are you a Led Zeppelin fan? Uh, I work work in a recording studio in Holland with them at one point. Yes, I met I spent several days with them and the Rolling Stones. I was doing voiceovers for something, and uh, Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones were in the next studio. Well, I'll tell really you. Nice. 
bad people. Do you want the good news or the bad news? What's the bad news? The bad news is that... Um, I've forgotten what the bad news is. They've probably forgotten me entirely. No, I was going to say something about asking facetious questions and not knowing what the answer would be. That, that was it, yeah. The, the, the bad news is that I just asked you a facetious question thinking I was being clever and you made me look like a complete muppet. The good news is that that's one of the best answers to a question that I've ever had on the programme. Oh, good. <laughs> Have a cracking weekend, Jeremy. <laughs> and you. <laughs> It's 11.46, I love this. It. I couldn't give Jeremy a Ray Liotta, much as I would have liked you, but uh, would like to do so. I can't give a Ray Liotta for something that's popped up completely by accident. It's only when I'm talking about something specific and a contributor comes on whose relevance to the conversation that we're having is, is breathtakingly great. Um, but, well, I, I have quite a few of you, like me, I hope that he writes his memoirs. What an amazing life he seems to have had. It's sort of slightly glib and facetious question. Are you a Led Zeppelin fan, Jeremy? And Jeremy responds, well, well, actually, I was in the studio next to them many years ago in Germany while doing some voiceover work. Rolling Stones on the other side, Led Zeppelin on this side. And there's a... Uh, uh, where is it? This is from Dave in Shepherd's book. Great radio, James. It's so good to laugh out loud. You really did just get done. I'm here to amuse. Tony's in Enfield. Back to homeopathy, Tony. What would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, mate. Um, yeah. <laughs> is that it? Very, <laughs> <laughs> very, very sceptical about homeopathy. Um, my two boys, I've got two boys, 22 and 18. When they were both born, mm. they, they suffered from horrendous chest infections, chest problems, had problems breathing. Um, one of them was actually in hospital on a nebulizer for a full week and his mum slept by his side on the floor next to his cot for a full week. Um, very worrying times. The, the hospitals couldn't do anything for him, or for both of them. Um, my, my wife was at a wit's end and she, she was recommended homeopathy by one of the nurses. And it really? worked. And it worked. I need to speak to her, don't I? Because she, yeah, because because well, she she got very very into it. She went. Um, no, I mean the nurse. I mean the, the nurse oh, the rather nurse, than yeah, your yeah. wife, because it well, might be the more mental than physical. You, the, the placebo effect on the brain is considerable, and it even works with people who don't have faith in the placebo. Do you see what I mean? With people who it, it's it's one of the great mysteries of science, but it doesn't affect anything outside the brain. It just it just affects how you feel, and that's why I said to the ex-psychiatric nurse, Paul, that that could surely help aid recovery. That's what I was going to come on to. Can you, can you place a placebo or say a placebo can work on a one-year-old child that doesn't even walk? Well, you would obviously expect me to say no, but given that yeah. you know me, Terry, uh, you won't be too surprised to learn that I'm going to have a crack at saying yes. And I would argue that that would be the same as what the fella said about the vets. Okay. Do you see what I mean? So actually, what 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 that does is is provide the parent with reassurance, helps the parent calm down, it de-stresses the parent, and that contributes to the recovery time of the of the one year old child. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm still on the fence, but yeah. having having been there and and seen it now, there was I, I, so much so that when my uh, we we had to pay for ours. Mm. And it was fifty pounds a visit every time, and at the time we never had a pot to do the proverbial in, <laughs> and um, yes. and it, it, it sort of you know half and half half of it annoyed me because I was like, what, where are we putting this money? And then it sort of started to work. Now one day one of the boys was seriously ill; he lost oh. all the colour in his face. He went very very grey. Oh, um, I'd, I'd run her up to um, the, the homeopath. Um, we was in there, she was chatting with my wife, I didn't know. And I used, to, I used to actually say to her, when she used to run the boys up there, when they were sort of not as bad, I used to say, oh, are you off to your, your witchcraft class? Yes. And think, you know, just take the mick out of her. Um, but yeah, this, this particular day was really bad. He looked like it was a death door. Oh, so man. we rushed him in the house. Well, before and, you went to the um, doctors, you took him to the homeopath? Yeah. Wow. That, yeah, that worries that me. My wife. Well, my wife, as I say, she went off and, and did a short college course on it. She read up on loads of books on it. I don't know if you know much about the the history of medicine. I don't know if even if this is true. This is what she told me and she read about. Samuel Harneman. Um, how, well, apparently, I mean, for the obvious reasons, um, homeopathy has been around a lot longer than... 
chemical um, medicine because chemicals weren't about. Well, no, it hasn't, America. is it? Because because you can go no. back thousands of years and find people licking tree bark that contains exactly, aspirin. Exactly. So that that's a chemical. So but uh, homeopathy that... is the idea that a tiny, tiny bit of the thing that makes you ill can cure you if you've got that illness. Yeah, now this belladonna. Now that's this is the and name that's a I chemical. remember. That's now a that's, chemical. Oh, was it? Yeah, but it's just naturally occurring. So that, that's, I mean, you're right, when you talk about synthesised medicines, you could make a case for saying that homeopathy is older than synthesised industrial production of medicine. But in terms of, of quite a lot of medicine is going to be based on natural remedies. That's not the same as homeopathy. Right, OK. I don't think it well, is, we, anyway. But uh, do you know what? We, the more we, I talk um, to people like you, the more I think it would be really stupid to ban it. Because if you think it works and it hasn't made anything worse, then good luck to you. But I do, I, I do think that when I use the example from my childhood of that woman whose baby had a club foot, I do find the idea yeah. of dashing to the holy water before the doctor a bit odd. Yeah. Yeah, no, but th this this one particular time, it, it, it this was the time it sort of made me think, does, yeah. this, does this really work? I still think, does it really work? But having seen it with my own eyes, we walked into this house, as I said, the boy looked like he was at death's door, he had no colour or anything. No, I get it, it. Was just I get like it. Limp. She gave him this, and if you've seen them, they're the tiniest of tablets. Yes. They're the, so, so small. And she said to us, this could either work in five minutes or it could work in a day or two. Or, or, or maybe so a couple of weeks. Mouth. She's covering her bats, mate. Well, she, we popped it in his mouth. Yeah. By the time we had his seatbelt on in the car, the colour had come back to his face, and it was like nothing. But here's the nothing thing. was wrong with him. Here is the thing. You have no way of knowing that that no. wouldn't have happened if you'd stayed at home or gone to the exactly. football. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the same with the chest infections. I don't know whether he, you know, as he was no, getting... And, and, and with Mike's ingrown toenail. I've been one of these, a typical bloke that won't go to the doctors if there's something wrong with him and, and I, I don't like medicine and I'm just one of these people that thinks the body is a great healer, it'll heal. There are obviously certain things that won't. Um, but sure. I no, I, well, that was the other well point about evolution, wasn't it? That we have developed increasing abilities to, to recover from things and homeopathy sometimes yeah. steps in to be part of what would have happened anyway. But who are we to... Who are we to quibble? Do you know, I think drinking a lot of vodka creates um, a, a sterilised atmosphere inside you and that means you get fewer illnesses. Otherwise, <laughs> why do they have rubbing alcohol in hospitals? Why do you use alcohol to keep your hands clean? I yeah, think you should yeah, keep your whole no, system no. clean by drinking loads of neat vodka. Perhaps that's why I'm over real. <laughs> same it, same it, same it. Cheers. There's a general kind of, in the media, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that people don't know about, about numbers. I'm a numbers guy. I'm a dweeb, all right? I apologize. I'm a bit of a nerd about these kind of things. I get really pissed off when people give out about, like, crime going up, when, say, the numbers are definitely going down. And then if you go, but the numbers are going down, they go, but the fear of crime is rising. And you go, well, so what? You know what I mean? Zombies are at an all-time low level, but the fear of zombies could be incredibly high. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean we have to have government policies to deal with the fear of zombies. It's ridiculous, for Christ's sake. The NHS, had a, there was a survey in the NHS about dentistry where they found that some people are removing their own teeth. You know? And they brought on some senior dentists of the Sky News and gave out to them and said, how dare, this is terrible, people are removing their own teeth. And this guy stood there and went, well, obviously, systems should be put in place to deal with, which is stupid. He should have just gone, well, these people are clearly morons of the high end art. <laughs> I mean, who removes their own teeth, for Christ's sake? I'm a dentist. I don't remove my own teeth. You know what I mean? <laughs> but there's kind of a notion that everyone's opinion is equally valid. My arse, bloke who's a professor of dentistry for 40 years, does not have a debate with some idiot who removes his teeth with string and a door, right? <laughs> It's nonsense. And they'll have this all the time with medical stuff on the television. You'll have a doctor on and they'll talk to the doctor and be, oh, doctor this and doctor that, and what happened there, and doctor isn't it awful, right? And then the doctor will be talking about something with all the benefit of research and medical evidence, and they'll turn away from the doctor in the name of balance and turn to some quack witch doctor, homeopath, horseshit peddler on the other side of the studio. <laughs> and I'm sorry if you're into homeopathy. It's water. How often does it need to be said? It's just water. You're healing yourself. What do you give yourself the credit? Jesus, homeopaths get on my nerves with the old, well, science doesn't know everything. Well, science knows it doesn't know everything. Otherwise, it'd stop. But it... <laughs> but as well as that, you know, I would have it. But as well, just because science doesn't know everything doesn't mean you can fill in the gaps with whatever fairy tale most appeals to you. <laughs> No, you, 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 well, the great thing with homeopathy is you can't overdose on it. Well, you can fucking drown. Uh, 
I'm sorry. It seems harsh, and I used to be much more generous about it, but right now I would take homeopaths and I'd put them in a big sack with psychics, astrologers, and priests, and I'd close the top of the sack with string, and I'd hit them all with sticks. And I really wouldn't worry who got the worst of the belt of the sticks, right? Anyone in answer to the difficult questions in life, the I don't know what happens after I die, or, or please what happens if my loved ones die, or how can I stop myself dying, the big questions gives you an easy bullshit answer, and you go, well, do you have any evidence for that? And they go, there's more to life than evidence. <laughs> Get in the fucking sack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, herbal medicine. Oh, herbal medicine has been around for thousands of years. Indeed it has, and then we tested it all, and the stuff that worked became medicine. <laughs> and the rest of it is just a nice bowl of soup and some potpourri. So knock yourself out. <laughs> But it is just one of these, it's one of these like, ridiculous things. Like, well, you never see that balancing with really, really hard science. You never see it with like, physics. Like, you never see like, a guy on talking from NASA about a space station. They go, oh, Mr. NASA guy, you, you're, you have a new space station. And they talk and then they go, right, but that's very interesting. But for the sake of balance, we must now turn to Barry, who believes the sky is a carpet painted by God. <laughs> Barry, what do you think of this space station plan? Well, it's clearly ridiculous. What are they going to do, hook it onto the carpet? <laughs> you're absolutely right, Barry. You're very right. You're very right. You really are. <laughs> Oh, I love that kind of stuff, like whatever. But all of the kind of nonsense of all the fairy tales, homeopathy, chiropractic, all of this kind of stuff, like whatever, ridiculous. And they make billions every year. Nutrition. Oh, I've spoken about this before. Here's my favourite little fact. If anyone describes this ever to you as a nutritionist, just be slightly wary, right? What they're saying may be perfectly true, but nutritionist isn't a protected term. Anyone can call themselves a nutritionist, right? Dietitian is the legally protected term. Right? A dietitian is like dentist, and nutritionist is like toothologist. <laughs> I mean, I could call myself a nutritionist, and I'd be a phenomenally popular nutritionist. People would come from miles around, I'd be going, listen, you look fantastic, let's have a pint. Come on, come on, I'll <laughs> You fat bastard, I'll wrestle you, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's ridiculous, and it is just, we, even though there's loads of evidence for these kind of stuff, we still on some level would sooner believe the story that our mother tells us about a woman she knew who had a headache, and then she rubbed a cat on the side of her head, and the headache was gone the next day, right? <laughs> and we'll even take some things for granted about our own health. There was a thing on the cover of the, of the London Evening Standard. The London Evening Standard, about a, a, during the year, had this thing where it said, 10 symptoms you should not ignore. And you read that and you're thinking, right, this is going to be something which I've had for a while, but it's been low level and I've never done anything about it, but it hasn't gone away and maybe I should get that checked out. That's what you presume it is, you know what I mean? And like, you know, oh, that pain in my arm is still there. I can't seem to clear that chesty cough. The first three symptoms you should not ignore were rectal bleeding, <laughs> loss of height, <laughs> and sudden blindness. <laughs> Who ignores sudden blindness? <laughs> who sits in the office at lunchtime going, oh, who turned out the lights? <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I can't see a thing, it's awful. I'm no use to anyone today. <laughs> I like to phone. That's all I can do. That's all I'll be good for today. Oh, don't make a fuss, don't make a fuss, don't make a fuss. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of lecturing you on how to live your life. I wouldn't dream of lecturing you about health. That would be, be arrogant of me, like as arrogant as these people. Like, look at me. I'm a big guy, right? You know what I mean? Like, I'm no model for anyone when it comes to health. I winter well, as you said, <laughs> euphemistically. Uh, and I know this. It gets reflected to me in weird ways. We went to buy a car during the year. Myself and the wife went to buy a car, and we're sitting in the garage, and on the garage forecourt, there's a little two-seater sports car, and I said, listen, I know we're not going to buy Can I just sit in it? Because I've always wanted one, can I just sit in it? She goes, all right, you can. And I sat in the little two-seater sports car, and I just looked and went, how do I look? She goes, you look like Noddy. <laughs> It's 11.57. Susan is in Hastings. Susan, what would you like to say? Oh, hi there, James. That was interesting about the vodka. Yes, was, I don't know if I should recommend that. Ofcom probably have regulations <laughs> I don't. that don't know. I was joking. Everyone relax. Carry yeah, on. I don't think you can recommend that one. Certainly <laughs> I can't. Um, so I'm a psychologist traditionally and a psychotherapist, and uh, I trained for about eight years now in all different complementary types of energy medicine. So I have a practice in Harley Street and in Sussex. I'm calling from Sussex at the moment. Okay. And I, I'm really interested in this conversation because I watch every day of the week people heal their bodies 
through healing their mind. I'm also a neuropsychologist, so I work with the brain relay, so I'm scientific. I don't, I don't, I don't want to run out of time before we've had the full yeah. benefit of your knowledge. Do you believe that homeopathy is efficacious, that it actually has a chemical effect on, on a human body? Yeah, I think we call it soul medicine. So basically, well, That's the opposite of efficacious and chemical, isn't it? Yeah, I know, but essentially we are that as well, aren't we? No. So we're, uh, you know, we've got chemicals within us. Yeah. Yes. So we have chemicals in our brain, we have dopamine, all different chemicals. And so when we're working with the trauma in our mind and the things that have happened to us in our life, I'm a specialist in trauma, really. Yes. Essentially what happens is when we heal that trauma, however we choose to do it, yeah, Whether yeah, I'm with you. Whether it's through homeopathy or with whatever we choose, when we heal that trauma, the body then shows us that message. And you would never be able to prove that, would you, in an experiment in a laboratory condition? Well, I mean, the no, you thing couldn't. Is, is, I see it every day. No, it, it, precisely. This is why I'm. What, this yeah. is why I'm feeling myself change a little bit on this um, yeah. issue because yeah. you can't prove any of what you've just said. And everyone can queue up with anecdotes, starting with Mike's ingrown toenail and ending with your panoply of qualifications. But the point is, um, I think the best thing I've heard this hour is you're, you're suggesting that it doesn't matter how you heal the trauma, if the trauma is yeah. healed, then it's going to be good for every part of your being. Absolutely. And I loved what you said um, about how if you feel better in your mind, then obviously you're going to feel better generally. Um, and a gentleman said, well, that's, no, that doesn't work. And I said, well, actually... If you can find a way to heal your trauma... Yes, everything else gets better. That happened. I work with veterans and PTSD oh, quite well, often. Oh, well, thank you for that. And when, when I work with them, I notice that their bodies become freer, they're not showing the message. The, the physical like follows that. the psychological, eh? And, and um, I, I, do you know, I wonder if... I, I'm going in all the wrong directions as I get older. I'm getting less sceptical, less cynical and less right-wing. What is wrong with me? I think I'm like the Benjamin Button of, uh, of politics and, and social issues. I, I started my life ancient and I'm getting younger with every passing year because I, I, I... Don't laugh. I've changed my mind about homeopathy. <laughs> when well, I said I'd changed my mind, um, I, I, I didn't mean that I now think homeopathy works uh, in a medical sense. I, I mean, I think it could be easily construed as a force for good. But, but yeah, I mean, David tweets to say... When you heard the phrase, he was at death's door, so we rushed him to the homeopath, that is the answer to your question, what's the harm? I think you're right as well. I, I kind of... I, I, let's move on to something else. I, I, I feel un uncharacteristically uncertain.